Uh, let's talk a little bit about this chapter, chapter 8 and the reason for God, uh, the clues for God. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm going to have you answer them, and then I'm going to kind of, uh, use, oh, I didn't do a, a dark. Uh, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of, uh, I don't know, explanation around them uh, as well. So uh, here's your, your dark for today. Horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, hey, and the horse says, yeah, sure. Okay. Makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so here's uh, the first question. Rather than saying we have proof for God, what other terms does uh, Tim Keller use rather than proofs for God? Clues of God is one, yeah. Or, or clues uh, for God's reality or for his, his reality. That he's real. Divine fingerprints. Yeah, we can see divine fingerprints, almost like in a... In a court case where they have fingerprints on the murder weapon, right? That's a bad thing. They can trace that back to the person, right? Trace by God's fingerprints. Good job. So, why is the Big Bang a clue for God's reality? Davis, is that your hand up? Okay, so everything that that has a beginning has a cause, right? So uh, there, there has to have been a cause. What else? Yeah. It would have to be because there was no no um, time or space, right, before that. So uh, it would have had to have been something outside of that, outside of time and space. What else? Oh. Um, everything in the world, we look around and we see everything in the world, and, and uh, everything in the world is, is contingent, meaning it has a cause outside itself. So I, I'm not going to think that this table just like me, right? It had a cause outside itself. It didn't create uh, itself. And, and that means that the entire universe is just, in, in Keller's word, a huge pile of such contingent entities. Everything in the universe had a cause. The universe itself had a cause. Um, so uh, um, everything um, had a cause. And so this... This means it would be, um, the, the universe would be dependent um, on something outside itself, uh, something to cause it, something to cause it to come into being. Uh, something had to make the Big Bang happen. The only question is what made it happen? Because, but, the, because the what, whatever the what is, must come from outside the natural world. You have to be super natural, right? Uh, because the natural world didn't exist before the Big Bang. So it would have to be a supernatural, non-contingent. So it would have to exist by itself. It would it would have it would not have to have a creator. Because if there is, then then there's something behind that. There's something something in the beginning had to be Supernatural and uncreated. Does that make sense? Um, and that sounds a lot like God, does it not? Supernatural, non-contingent. Didn't mean he made us always. 
Now, this isn't on its own proof for God. Now, uh, uh, I, I want to say something about the cosmic welcome mat, and much of that is covered in, in Big Atheist. Um, so, uh, I would prefer, in this case, that you use other clues from, um, from uh, Keller's book that you, because a lot of the, the Big Bang and the, um, and the design of the universe and all of that is really covered well. Use Big Atheist for that, but then don't also say, oh, this is also my thing. No, I want separate things for your, what you talked about. Okay? You might add something in, but then have something that's just from color. Have we got that? Okay. Um, so why is the regularity of nature a clue for God's reality? First of all, what does he mean by the regularity of nature? Yeah, the laws of nature. And and what is regular about that? They are always true. The laws of nature are always true. There aren't exceptions to the laws of nature. I'm not sure where I got this. It's a press wall. I have three of them. I must have thought I was really stressed. Um, so, what happens if I drop this ball? Why? Why does it drop? Why does it fall? Every time. But can't I throw it up? But it still comes down. Is there any way that I can throw this ball, or that you can throw this ball, <laughs> uh, where it will not fall? Outer space, but on Earth. No. Why? Because the gravity on Earth is a law of nature. Right now, space has different laws, but it still has laws, um, and 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 they are unassailable. They are unavoidable, uh, and gravity is is one of those. Um, and so, the regularity of nature means that. The, the universe is ordered. It has rules that it must follow, unlike us. There are rules. But we don't always choose to follow them. Nature must follow the rules. It is ordered. Why? Why is it ordered? It was created to be ordered, but, but if, you're, if you're not going to say that, if you're going to say it's all a cosmic accident, you can't you can't um, defend. You can't explain the orderliness of nature. We've talked about that, that 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 an accident doesn't create order; it creates disorder. Think of any accident you've ever been you know witness to or part of. It disorders. Accidents disorder. They do not order. Um, not that this has ever happened in my classroom, but put yourself back in the room. And the teacher leaves the room. What happens? Come on, you four and a row, bro, be honest. What happens? Like, you know, some of the girls are just sitting there and doing what they're supposed to do. But y'all are starting to talk, or you're doing something, or you're punching each other, right? Because the person that was the person that was hopefully bringing order to the classroom leaves. Once that person that's bringing order leaves, you have disorder. If there's no one to order the universe, it would not be order. It's just an accident. And accidents can't order. They can only disorder. Uh, and so again, uh, regularity only comes with conceptual design. Doesn't come with accidents. Um, again, not proof for God, but a clue that something ordered 
and something maintains the image of the individual. Uh, why is beauty uh, a clue for variety? This one says this is page one thirty three of our book. I don't know if this is probably something that's close to that, but it's not the same. It's a hard back version. If there is no God, and everything in this world is the product of, as Bertrand Russell famously put it, an accidental collection of atoms, then there is no actual purpose for which we, we were made. We are accident. If we are the product of accidental natural forces, then what we call beauty is nothing but neurological hardwired, uh, nothing but a neurological hardwired response to particular data. You only find certain scenery to be beautiful because you had ancestors who knew you would find food there, and they survived because of that neurological future. And now we have it too. In the same way, though music may feels significant, the significance is an illusion. Love too must be seen in this life. If we are the result of blind natural forces, then what we call love is simply a biochemical response inherited from ancestors who survived because this trait helped them survive. The problem with that is that we cannot escape the feeling that love really does have meaning, that beauty, thing, beautiful things truly are beautiful. None of us can escape that. Even atheists fall in love. And find it meaningful. And yet, if it's an accident, it is, it is devoid of that meaning. That meaning. So we can't escape the belief that there, there is real truth. There is real meaning in the world. But that is only possible if there's a creator. If we were created by an all-powerful, all-loving, personal being. Truth. Meaning, beauty, are not possible if we're just present. But try as we might, we cannot escape the idea that love and beauty come from something. That there is more to the world than just the physical, just us. It's why even. Uh, Atheists, even agnostics, try to find some meaning for their life, some purpose for their life. But if we're accidents, there is no purpose, there is no meaning. Again, not proof that there's a God, but a clue for God. Uh, what does, and then, now this gets a little deeper and a little more difficult to, to wrap your. Um, Uh, so I'm going to leave, read the last paragraph, um, a little bit from the second last paragraph of um, Beauty and Meaning. Um, he says, doesn't the appetite for food in us mean that food exists? Isn't it true that innate desires correspond to real objects that can satisfy them? Such as sexual desire corresponding to sex, physical appetite corresponding to food, tiredness corresponding to sleep, and relational desires corresponding to function. Doesn't the unfulfillable longing evoked by beauty qualify as an innate desire? 
We have a longing for joy, love, and beauty. But no amount of thought or quality of food, sex, friendship, or success can satisfy. We want something that nothing in this world can fulfill. Isn't it at least a clue that this something that we want fulfills? Uh, that this unfillable longing that qualifies as a deep inner human desire, and that makes it a meaning for us. So the next part is, is a little bit more deep and a little bit more difficult to understand. But what does uh, what does Keller mean by the clue killer? Is this is the point at which um, an atheist might uh, might have a, an objection? So what is in in an atheist mind in an atheist's mind? What is the clue? You need to go down to the next uh, it says the clue killer. And I, I, would, I would make it even more general than that, that evolutionary biology. So that's part of evolutionary biology. So evolutionary biology claims to be the clue killer, that everything can be, uh, can be, every question can be answered through evolutionary biology. So in other words, an atheist would say that evolutionary biology disproves all of the clues. So evolutionary biology says that religion must have had some adaptive advantage. Do you know, uh, do you remember from biology what that means? What? Uh, the, uh, evolutionary biology says that religion must have some adaptive advantage. The only reason people believe in religion is that at some point it had some adaptive advantage. Help them survive, exactly. That it, it, it must have helped people survive in some way. Now, let's just set aside for a minute the truth that that early people on the earth, uh, people in uh, you know long, many thousands of years ago, believed things like thunder being caused by the gods walking around you know upstairs. I'm not sure how anything false ever helped us. Misinformation has ever helped someone survive. And also, let's put aside for just a second that being a Christian in the first century would get you killed. There was no adaptive advantage to being a Christian in the first century, and it will still get you killed in many places uh, on this earth where, where you are opposed to that. Um, so there would be no adaptive advantage to that. But, but here's what evolutionary, bi evolutionary bio biologists are saying. They're saying that religion and religious beliefs were endorsed, this is a quote, endorsed by natural selection. In other words, natural selection created them. And natural selection is the reason why they were beliefs. For some reason that we don't know and that they don't know, that nobody knows, it, their survival was improved. Their ability to survive was improved by religious beliefs. Um, so look at page, well, I can't tell you. Um, it is under clue killer, um, a couple of, um, let's see, the third paragraph, it begins, despite fierce debates, uh, it says this, uh, despite fierce debates, debates within the field of evolutionary theorists, evolutionary theorists all agree that our capacity to believe in God is hardwired into our physiology because 
that was directly or indirectly associated with traits that helped their ancestors adapt to their environment. That's why arguments for God appeal to so many of us. That's all there is to it. The clues are nothing, uh, are clues to nothing. However, there may there are many who believe not only that the clue killer argument is a fatal contradiction, has a, a, a fatal contradiction in it, but that it actually points to another clue for God. In the last part of Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, probably is more famous for he admits that since we are products, we are the product of natural selection, we can't completely trust our own senses. After all, evolution is interested only in preserving adaptive behavior, not true belief. In the New York Times Magazine article, another scientist says, in some circumstances, a symbolic belief that departs from factual reality bears better. In other words, paranoid false beliefs are often more effective at helping you survive than accurate ones. I don't believe Dawkins or other evolutionary theorists realize the full implications of this crucial insight. Evolution can only be trusted give us cognitive faculties uh, that help us live on, not to provide ones that give us an accurate and true picture of the world around us. Uh, Patricia Churchill puts it like this. Uh, actually, I'm going to go to page 39. So, however, if we can't trust our belief-forming faculties to tell us the truth about God, why should we trust them to tell us the truth about anything? including evolutionary science. If our cognitive faculties, our abilities to think, only tell us what we need to survive, not what is true, why trust them at all? So if you're going to say that we can't believe because our, 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 our ability to reason, our ability to think can't be trusted, that we can't believe uh, in religious truths, you have to say that about all things that you have to say that about evolution itself. Why is it just religious things? Uh, if, if biology can only tell us uh, what was adaptive, it can't tell us what is true. And evolution itself has to be a question. Um, so evolutionary biologists say that religion and religious beliefs were endorsed by natural selection, but if evolutionary bi biologists are going to be honest and fair, then they must admit that we can we can trust our mind. They must admit that we can trust our minds, uh, what our minds tell us about things, including uh, what our minds tell us about God. Or they need to admit that we can't trust our minds about anything, including evolution. Um, so that means that the clue killer is actually a clue uh, that God exists. Uh, so I'm going to read this one last uh, little paragraph before we talk about the It comes down to this. If, as the evolutionary scientists say, what our brains tell us about morality, love, and beauty is not real, if it is merely a set of chemical reactions designed to pass on our genetic code, then so is what their brains tell them about the world. Then why should they trust them? So... Then the last thing is that the clue killer is really a clue. How is the clue killer really a clue? These aren't giving you a good uh, idea. Why is it really a clue? Yeah, the basically it's it's self defeating or or it's I, I don't know if I'd say it's self defeating. I'd say it is inconsistent to say, well, you can't believe this because it's just uh, part of adaptive advantage. You can't believe this because it's just your neurons firing. But you can believe this because they want to believe this and they don't want to believe this. That's not science. That's preference. 
So the clue killer is really a clue because without God, nothing makes sense. We can't really believe anything without God. Biology. And yet, we lose though, and, and we actually believe that things do make sense. And we go on believing in math and science and beauty and all the things we believe. People might believe that life is meaningless, but it turns out they don't believe that way. They live as though life. And if we're all there is, if we're just a cosmic accident, life doesn't have any meaning. If when we're dead, we're dead and we're done, life is meaningless. But we don't live that way. Do you think your familial, your family relationships have meaning? Do you live as though they're meaningful? Or if something happens to one of your siblings or your parents or whatever, a good friend. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. No, we live as though there's meaning. Why? Why do we live as though there's meaning? Even when we're being told. Even if you believe life is meaningless. You live as though life has meaning. That's a clue that there's something beyond us. That's a clue that there's something more. We see our, our we see all kinds of things as meaningful. We see our relationships as meaningful. We see our work as meaningful. We even see the outcome of sporting events we're interested in as meaningful. So might that then mean that there truly is meaning in the world? And that in itself. So I know the Keller book is not easy to understand. That's why I did this to kind of help you understand a little bit. Hopefully you did that. Um, you have uh, the rest of the hours to work on your um, your letter, and you will have all of tomorrow uh, to work on your letter as well. Uh, and you will have a verse quiz on Friday. And you have Friday to work on that letter. As well. So it is due Monday. Next day I didn't give you enough time. Have a trip to Chicago. Okay? Questions? Yes. Are we going to go over our questions in the. I did do that, and um, uh, it's it's on YouTube. So it was, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I taped it. Yes. Uh, yeah, to get a get a laptop or to work on the thing. Yeah, so just bring a laptop in here. Uh, first of all, there's plenty of class in there, but if there isn't, um, you might have a Yes.